asking, hi, Johnny, oh my God. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm really well. So I have to be completely honest with you. Before this conference, I didn't know who you were. And, That's okay. Uh, when I, but here's what's exciting, and I love when this happens, because it's usually those people, and this happens every conversation, I go to the one person, like I'm like, who's this person, or whatever, and then I listen to their stuff, and I'm like, how have I never heard of this person before? <laughs> and that's exactly how I felt. Um, out of all the presentations, I really resonated with your material. Thank you. Because I feel like one part um, that's not as covered as much as it should be anyways is the esoteric yes. or the mystical side of all of this because there is so much. Yes. Um, so many things that struck me, the symbolism. Me personally on my journey, I have been <laughs> seeing symbols and now I'm like, were these always here? Or am I just noticing it more? Like one thing, the wing sun does symbol. Um, yes. I've seen I seen so many logos now just randomly the laurel leaf like uh, logo I don't know if you've seen just but all kinds of them what are some of the symbols that you feel like are are really prevalent in modern day society that have huge ancient roots and I know there's probably a lot well absolutely you mentioned symbolism but a lot of people want to find a connection to something evil with symbolism mm -hmm. but as you may have recalled during my presentation I said you know knowledge is useless without wisdom so for example I could point out to you that there's a goddess on the side of our Starbucks cup and that goddess on the side of the Starbucks cup is actually not only Isis, but also Pisces. And she's a siren. That doesn't mean that it's evil or negative. In fact, uh, I have a, a really great understanding about where that logo came from and the, the ideas that came from behind it. Uh, and all these symbols are very powerful because they speak to our subconscious. There's a very ancient language of symbolism that comes back uh, in the world that we resonate with. And it's not only in sort of a genetic, but a spiritual memory. And I believe that if we look at the symbolism, it really gives us clues and ideas about our history and where we come from. Okay, so another symbol that I gave examples for was during the presentation that you're watching up over there. I was talking about the idea that in Zoroastrianism that the prophet Zarathustra had encountered Ahura Mazda, that in the heavens this Ahura Mazda appeared and came down, and this was a winged creator god that came down, the creator of the universe, and when we see the Mazda car today, we no doubt see the Mazda symbol. So this is very important that when we start to read this language of symbolism that's been hidden for us, so there's a hidden story that we're not appreciating. And these symbols, because man, they're strategically almost some of the largest corporations. They're just kind of everywhere I'm noticing. That's right. Who do you think, if you were to guess, is the group, like some of them maybe call the Illuminati? I don't know. But behind, like how can it be that all these big corporations all have kind of this either similar symbols or who's behind all this? Well, at times, you know, we've seen symbols that are very coincidental or they're very, you know, harmless or meaningless. You know, there's nothing to it. And for the most part, I don't think there's an evil or... A pernicious agenda behind it or anything like that uh, but most certainly that we have seen symbols that are related to secret societies and secret societies have been abundant we've seen most certainly with the Knights of Malta uh, and other groups and the Templar Knights and everything uh, one of my favorite places in the world to go is Disneyland and Disneyland is not only loaded with secrets but it's loaded with beautiful Rosicrucian symbolism even its own address that was encoded there by Walt Disney who had a massive appreciation for the mysteries and so I don't think these are evil things but they they teach us to appreciate uh, this, this sort of a, a greater side to the world so again I, I brought up Manly Palmer Hall who is one of my great heroes the greatest esoteric historians of all time of the 20th century it was located out of uh, philosoph the Philosophical Research Society over in Los Feliz in uh, California near Griff Griffith Park. And he spent years talking about how these symbols were hidden and taught us more about humanity or where we're from and who we are. And I think it's so beautiful. I think it's so beautiful too because it's almost like when you're at that vibratory level, you just start yes. to see them and you get the information when you're ready for it. It's such a, Absolutely. and I just can't help but wonder who's putting them there. But Absolutely, especially, <laughs> especially religious symbols. Yeah. Now I feel that our religious symbols have our greatest clues mm. uh, because we see, for example, with the cross, the cross is, is far older than a Christian symbol. It's the, the symbol of the, it's the symbol of the light, it's the symbol of the sun. When you take the Celtic cross, it's the shorthand of this, of the, the four seasons of the year divided up. Uh, we go back into the cross that Kukulakan or Quetzalcoatl carried. Uh, we have the cross going back into the Atlanteans, the Assyrians, and the Cadians. Uh, these symbols we now know even are linked into our physics. Uh, there's a, a new study that's been done that the holographic image of a photon actually looks like it's the Templar cross. And here's a Templar cross that's associated with the light and energy. So we have a holographic uh, 
you know, projected, scientific, ancient, historical, symbiotic, synergistic, interconnected symbol is so powerful and important. Um, as you were talking about that, I just thought of something. Um, all the different ancient um, mythological cultures. So we have like, you know, Norse mythology, Greek yes. mythology, Egyptian mythology, all uh, uh, Celtic. What do you think was, if you had to guess, um, the first one? Like where do you, because you know how a lot of them are kind of almost spin-offs of each Absolutely. other in a lot of ways. Do you have an idea where maybe it all originated? Absolutely. I'm going to go back that, you know, there's been so many cycles on this planet. Uh, I'm going to relay a story to you, though. I'm going to have to defer it over to the Atlantis story. So when Plato was initiated into the Egyptian mysteries and he learned of the Atlantis story, how it started, as we are told, in the Crimeas and the Timaeus, that he learns this story from his uncle Critias. And from his uncle Critias, he learns uh, this. Uh, it's relayed to him from his great-great-grandfather, Solon. Now, Solon traveled to Egypt. And he met with this priest named Sanchis of Saïs. And Saïs was the ancient name for Egypt. Okay, so he gets the story when he goes there that he's told, silly, silly Solon, you Greeks are like children to us. You think you have this flood story, you're so sophisticated, you know where your civilization comes from, but there have been many civilizations on this earth that have come along and they've, had, they've been destroyed by fire, by water, uh, by all these sort of cataclysms, and you have been reset and recycled over and over again. So we know that you know civilization has started over and over again and it's like an onion, the layers that we peel back. And a good example for that, Ashley, is with Egypt. And for your listeners that might be out there, or your watchers, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As they might recall, if you look at Egypt today, we have an Islamic layer. Uh, and this is something that uh, Stephen Mailer's reminded me of. We peel back the Islamic layer, we go back to the Coptic Christian layer. We peel back that layer, we go back over to a, uh, a Jewish layer. Then we peel that back and we might go back over to a Greco-Roman layer, uh, and then a Persian layer. And then beyond that, we have a pre-dynastic Egyptians, which is really incredible because we start getting into things like giants and all sorts of strange mysteries. Now, what I think when we want to see where everything began, I go back into northern India. And I'll tell you why I think that. Because when I've been in Egypt with my friend Brian Forrester, he made an observation that when we're at all the ancient temples and he's measuring the gates of the temples, all the temples are off in the cardinal directions of northeast, southwest. They're all off by 23 degrees. And what that tells us is, is this lines up perfectly with our Atlantis story that some cataclysms took place upon the Earth, whether it was that great asteroid or fireball from the gods, solar storms that took place. What happens is the Earth was shifted off its axial rotation by 23 degrees. That means our North Pole and our South Pole were two different places. So in Emmanuel Velikovsky's work, World on Collisions, we have about five chapters dedicated to the, the Arctic Center. So where we had looked there, we had tropical flora and fauna that would have been flash frozen with frozen mammals. And we know there was a migration of an ancient people known as the Hyperboreans, okay? That, you know, this is very interesting. We had this giant, this race of giants and these beautiful beings that came down from the far north and they migrated into these certain paths. So what we believe, and the Nazis believe this also, actually, many of these ancient leaders in India and otherwise have taught this about the Aryans and their migrations, that they came down from the far north and they came down into the Indo-Gangenic plains of the Indo-Ganges that were India. They mixed with the Dravidian peoples who were already Sabinistic worshippers. They had a calendars uh, similar to the Akkadians. And because of these um, great cataclysms on the earth that took place about 12,000 years ago, we were moving out of a time called the Pleistocene period when we were moving out of this ice age and a mini ice age into what's now in the Holocene out of that. So into that migration that they moved out of, they came down to this area and they spread and this is where the mysteries and all the secrets of flying machines, Vimanas, everything moved into Asia Minor, then later into Northern Africa, into Egypt and it's more of a into Africa theory. So we have this great migration of uh, these patterns and then they rediscovered Egypt, reinitiated the mysteries, and we have these stories of Vimanas and mystical Buddhism known as Mahayana Buddhism. It's very fascinating. Sorry for the long answer. No, I um, The worst is when people give me one word answers. I'm like, uh, I'm not a one word answer guy. <laughs> Uh, so many questions, but another question. Um, with, I guess, some of the mythological ancient gods and goddesses of course. that we hear all these where stories about. Where do they come about. from? Where do they come from, and do you think they were real, or do you think they're archetypes for just different things? They're both. 
Uh, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. Thank you for being a great journalist. Okay, so what we see is in the ancient world when the fools were bowing before their statues, uh, the pre and all these areas giving these great uh, uh, magnificent sacrifices to the gods, these statues and bowing before marble, the wise always stood back and laughed because they saw as the fools were bowing before them and sacrificing that they saw within those statues were the personification of great truths. So for example, the statue of, um, well even the statue that we know, it's over at the Vatican today that people are kissing the feet off of St. Peter at uh, St. Peter's Basilica. In the Catholic Encyclopedia in their own literature, they admit that it's actually Zeus that people are bowing to. It's just so ridiculous, it's amazing. Uh, but within that, there is this idea that in these statues and these ideas there was the personifications of great astrological, astronomical truths. But at some point, just like in the lecture I gave today about the seven keys of the mysteries that Helena Petrovna Blavatsky taught us, that the lock must be turned seven times. When we're looking at the mysteries, we have different levels. We have a historical, a geographical, an astronomical, astrological, theagogic, religious level, right? So that you go through it. So you see that this is not just, this might have been a historical person. This might have been a real Ashley Dickel, a person that could have been there, but aside to you, you would have had something attached to you that was a great compliment from the mysteries that these were legends attached to you. Um, these were real beings. I believe that came back from the world uh, originally from these migrations and they were later brought into these traditions. Uh, for example, um, we have ma many stories even in our, our biblical and uh, ideas and even in Christendom that come back from the ancient world of Prometheus and other things that have been brought back or Mithraism and other things. Mm. Okay, so one thing I kind of find fascinating to think about, you think about right now the raising of consciousness and the raising of the vibration and everything of humanity yes. that's occurring and I'm sure you've heard of the Akashic Records. Of course. So what do you think how that could possibly impact disclosure when people start activating their third eye, their pineal gland to the, to the point where they're able to just turn into the records of everything in creation and get the answers themselves. We don't need Google anymore. We have essentially a kosher records, the spiritual Google, the esoteric Google, or um, just essentially not, not having to rely on any, any physical material. Do you think we're close to that? Or I, think, I think that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to naturally evolve those capabilities and uh, that's where we need to go and, and to evolve that on our own. In fact, that's actually one of the things that concerns me today when we talk about extraterrestrials and we talk about the ancient, we talk about the esoteric and religion, is that I believe there's a great admonishment in there uh, for transhumanism and the artificial intelligence agenda, why I believe that this extraterrestrial agenda is so important, this disclosure agenda is so important as well as this ascension process that we're going through of evolving ourselves and transcending. I'll give you a good example. Do you have any sort of religious background? Are you familiar with the Bible? I've read the whole thing twice. I was very religious growing up. Okay, are you familiar with the book of Revelation? Yeah. Okay, uh, by any chance would you happen to remember from your upbringing about who Christian scholars say wrote the book of Revelation in the Bible? Isn't it John? John, that's yeah. right. We have an idea that the Bible, the book of Revelation in the Bible was written by John uh, from Patmos. Okay, so from what I've discovered, that is absolutely not the case. And I've been over into Greece by the Aegean Sea, I've been over by Patmos, I've been to where they say he's buried in Ephesus over in Turkey near Kushadasi, I've been to these places. Now, what I see in this story, which absolutely fascinates me, is that there was a group of monks that were living on that particular island called the island of Patmos and they were called the Phrygians and they wore this red cap crown on their head and this cap crown was kind of like a Papa Smurf gnome hat okay and anybody in Europe that wore that hat or anywhere in the ancient world this is connected to over into uh, Midas or the uh, Gordian uh, King, anybody who had that got freedom and they had this great sense of liberty. In fact, the sons of the American Revolution, after they waved this liberty cap on the top of their pole, the liberty bell is in that shape. There's a type of magic mushroom known as the semi lanceata psilocybin uh, liberty cap mushroom that's named after this. It was very important to the Phrygians. They had this ancient book called the Book of the Apocalypse. This book was very old and it's the exact same book. It far predates the Bible. The idea that John wrote this book in the Bible has been disputed by all the church fathers. It was disputed uh, as called the Johannian theory or the Johannian theory. It was disputed by Martin Luther, uh, by Erasmus, all of them. They, they said, no way, that's not true. It was, again, it was kicked out over a dozen times, okay? 
So what's really fascinated me about this book and why it relates to disclosure, why it relates to transhumanism, why it relates to these agendas, and why I think it's so fascinating when we start to see the cross-referencing of this ancient history, esotericism, religion, ancient consciousness technologies, why I think it's amazing, okay, is that when we start to link it in, that these monks over there, they serve two particular gods. The two gods they serve, one god's name was Attis, or Adonis, okay? I won't talk about him. The other god that they served was called Ion. Now, Ion was the god of the air and the electricity that served over them. This was like an extraterrestrial force that served over them and held all the mysteries. If you talk to most Christian ministers, they don't even know what the symbolism in the book of Revelation means. They can't even tell you. But I'm going to give you something to think about right now. Um, the name Ion, if you take that name, if you think about if you have like an ionic air filter or an ionic water product, okay, that's to do with electricity, right? right. Like that serpentine energy I was talking about in the universe and where it's all around us. This is the same as the scalar energy that UFOs use. It's a very interesting energy that we have. So in the Latin, the I and the J are interchangeable. You can add a little squiggly line onto the end of the I, and then we get John, J-O-N, the Anglo-Saxon John. There we have John of Patmos. Here's an ancient text. It has Seda the whale from the ancient Aryan Hindu uh, depictions of astrology right in that book. This book was later brought in. It was Romanized, and they added stuff like, uh, this is also the Atlantis story, by the way, with the seven hills of Rome, which are the Vatacanus Hill, Palantina Hill, Capitolina Hill, all of these hills that are in there, they were later Romanized, just like the seven cities of Atlantis in the fall. What do you get in that Atlantis story that's similar to here in this uh, Revelation story, this apocalypse story, we have the story of a beast and taking a mark, which is like an artificial intelligence system you get. We also have this extraterrestrial presence, we have this energy. So we have a connection all the way across. Um, and I, I think that when we start to look at this, these, these references of where we're going, um, there's a very interesting story for humanity unfolding. You know, you really sparked another thought in my, my mind, which was what we see right now unfolding is like, in terms of disclosure, the war on consciousness or the yeah. war on spirituality that's happening right now. There's so many different tactics being employed by so many different agendas and agencies. It doesn't even matter at this point, but exactly. um, trying to lower mind our control. Vibration, mind control yeah. on so many different levels. Um, do you see that? Um, do you think it's basically a pointless um, aim essentially to kind of keep our vibration low when it's there they have no control over it like do you think that there's going to be something where there's nothing they can they can keep us lower like some people think there's the sun yeah. that there's um changes within the sun that are affecting and our chem DNA. chemtrails that are there that are blocking chem it chemtrails out. that are there to block it out for that reason so our dna doesn't activate we have all that 97 percent of junk dna mm -hmm. that's just sitting there like talk about a national security like imagine the point from the government all the time we get all our dna activated and we know everything about everything exactly. like there are some people who would not be okay with that so no, it's, it's definitely happening like that we've been under mind control for some time we've been We've been receiving this for a long time, and it's, it's, all, it's all part of it, but it's all part of our journey. We are here to grow and evolve, Ashley, and good things are coming. There is a very real reason we're all here, mm -hmm. and I'd like to remind everybody, it's just like my dear friend Daniel Brinkley says, you're all great and mighty, powerful spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. You have a reason for being here. You're precious. You are loved. There is a, there's a reason to be here. All your experiences are important. And it's not an accident. It's not doom and gloom. We're here for a real reason and good things are coming. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> hey, awesome. Sebastian agrees too. <laughs> He's smiling behind that camera. <laughs> awesome, Johnny. Well, I could go on forever and we definitely have to talk more. But um, is there anything else uh, that you just want to kind of get out there for the audience? Yes. I, I want people to know that this, disclo this disclosure subject is not just infotainment. I don't want you to take this information and I don't want you to look at all of the ideas about ETs, about UFOs, about strange facts and conspiracies and symbols. I don't want you to take all this information and say, that sounds really cool, that, that's something to think about. Yeah, that's a neat part about it. I love that stuff too. I love geeking out on all these symbols. That's great. At the end of the day, that's a lot of fun. That's what we like to do. But what, I'm, what I want you to do is I want you to become greater caretakers of the planet. I want you to take greater responsibility for yourself. I want you to realize that we're here to grow and evolve. We're here to show more love and kindness. And we're here to realize that if we want to become citizens of the universe, and I'm sure you'll agree, Ashley, and I'm sure you'll agree, Sebastian, that we first have to become citizens of this world and start showing kindness to one another because we are here to grow and evolve and your destiny is in the stars. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you, Ashley. Johnny. Thank you so much.